Hello, this is Bill Webb, aka Billy Indiana. Today I'm going to be doing a 3x3x3 review for Funfair by Good Games Publishing. Now, Good Games Publishing was kind enough to send me this as a review copy, and in my 3x3x3 review I'll be talking about three things I enjoy about the game, three things that either I didn't enjoy or I could see might frustrate other players, and then give you three recommendations for other games with some similar feels to Funfair. If you're interested, stick around. <laughs> The Fun Fair is created by Joel Finch with art by Mr. Cuttington, and it's actually a pretty simple game. There's a little bit of overhead at the beginning to learn, but um, it's it's all right here in front of you. You've just got some coins to spend. You've got your first player marker. This is the game tracker for all the steps in the game. We've got player cards. Each player will start with a showcase, and each player will start with a gate. I'm going to show you just a real quick thing about the gameplay and setup and not going into all the details, so this isn't an instructional video, but give you some background and then talk to you about those three things that I like, three things that maybe you might not like or I didn't enjoy, and then give you some other recommendations. So first, the setup. You have to set up the city cards, and city cards are going to give everybody in the game a nice benefit at the city phase of the game, and this little roller coaster is going to move along here and track the phases of the game. So to set it up, you're going to put two city cards face down. You're going to put this blueprint deck closing soon card here. And that's basically the timer for the game. And then you're going to put four other city cards on top. And the city card deck, like I said, gives you everybody in the game a benefit, but it is also the timer. So we're going to play through six rounds. After the fourth round, we can no longer use the blueprints or no longer gain any blueprints. And then after the sixth round, the game is over. The blueprints are goal cards, what you're trying to achieve in the theme park that you're creating. And the goal of this game is to create the best theme park that satisfies as many of these blueprints as you can gain, that wins potentially the award that's chosen for the game, and that also scores in terms of attracting a lot of people into the park. So these are going to be rated as easy, and they're marked down here in the corner. Some of them are difficult, and then there's also some medium ones in here. And obviously the easier ones are worth less points, medium more, and difficult the most. There's always a top part and a bottom part. If you satisfy the top part, then you can possibly satisfy the bottom part as a bonus. If you don't satisfy the top part, you're not eligible for the bottom part. And you also lose 10 points. So if you take these blueprints and you can never get rid of them once you have them, you have to make sure you have an opportunity to fulfill them. Otherwise, you're going to lose 10 points and have no opportunity to earn the bonus. Now, you don't start with any blueprints, but you're going to gain them slowly throughout the game. In fact, that's one of the options you have during game. Another way to score is, like I mentioned, these awards. And you're just going to pick one. There's a few that come with the game. And so uh, this first one for this game, we'll say, is build a park with the most quality icons. And there's a lot of icons on the cards, um, especially on the park cards that we'll be using. And so at, through the game, you're going to be seeing who can, at the end, have the most quality icons. And that's worth 15 points and it's a friendly tie. Now in the player um, aids here, it says also the sequence of steps we're gonna take here. The city step, which are these cards, the park steps, and you're gonna do three, unless you've already built your showcase, which gives you the opportunity to take a fourth step in each round. Then you're gonna go on to the guest step, where you're going to look at the stars you've earned in your park, and the stars are up in the upper right-hand corner, the gate earns you one star, and then all the other park attractions and upgrades you put into your park will earn you more stars. The showcase that you potentially build into your park has the most, and so it can earn three stars in your park. So you're going to add up the stars in your park at that point in the development you've had, and you're going to gain money for that. It's basically showing you how many people you've been able to attract into the park based on the quality of your park. And then some of the people you can hire, because some of these park cards are actually employees, if you hire um, employees into your park, some of them have a little ticket icon and they give you an extra bonus to score during those rounds in the guest phase. And then also, if you haven't built your showcase, so if it's still face down, then you're also going to get investment money, $5, onto that park. And so the longer you wait, the more money you're going to have invested in that park and the less it will cost you, the least it will cost you when you build it. Um, they all cost 20 now I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the final part of the setup. I have filled the market with six cards. I have five in my hand. Each player will start with five cards in their hand, and one of them must be an attraction. So if you don't get an attraction, you're going to grab five more. 
Everyone puts their gate out, which is worth one star, attracting one visitor. And they put their showcase face down because they haven't invested in it yet. They get $30, and one person is chosen as the starting player. The starting player then will move the roller coaster to the city event and read the city card. This one is a recycle program. Draw a park card, discard up to three from your hand, and gain three coins for each card discarded. So perhaps I draw this one and I decide I don't really want that one, I don't want that one, um, and let's say I don't want that one. So I could discard those three and gain nine coins. And money is tight, so that might be a wise move at some points in the game. All right, so once everyone has gone around the table and fulfilled the city action, the first player then takes the first park action. And the park actions are laid out on the cards. Now you can build, which means you can build one from the tableau, or sorry, from the market here, or you can build one from your hand. So let's say that uh, I see this cinema attraction. I build that for four coins, pay my coins, and all the attractions are played to the right of the main gate. If you hire any staff members, they get placed to the left. All right, that is one of the options I could take. Uh, another option I could choose is to take cards. I can take one from the market, and by the way, anytime one is bought or taken, you immediately fill the empty spot. So I could take one from here and put it in my hand instead of building. I could also take two blueprints and choose one or none to keep, remembering that if I can't fulfill them by the end of the game, I will lose 10 points. And so I want to be selective about those, but they are worth a lot of points, so I also want to get them. I could also take two park cards into my hand and keep one or none. I could also discard a card from my hand and then look at five part cards keeping one. So those are some different options I could do in the take function. The third option is to gather loose change. For every attraction you've built in your park, you're gonna gain a coin. And again, money is pretty tight, so sometimes you just need that couple of coins for the, a couple of attractions you have. And the last is you can demolish one of the cards in your park. And so if you've built something and you realize, oh, that's not gonna help me fulfill my blueprints, you could demolish one if you needed to do that. So I'll, each player does an action. It comes back around to the first player and they move it here and then they take a second action. They cycle around, third action. Now you don't get to take the fourth action until you have fulfilled or constructed the um, showcase attraction. And it says down at the bottom, you may take four actions each round. So once you've built the showcase, then you can have that fourth action. But until then, you only get three per round. Once we get to the guest roll, like I said earlier, you're going to look at how many stars you have and gain that many coins. And then you're going to look and see if you've hired any staff members, and some of them have tickets, which give you a bonus at every guest phase of the round. And then you're going to look at the showcases that aren't built, and you're gonna have an investment of five coins on that showcase until it's chosen to be. So it gets cheaper and cheaper each round, but, it's also worth three stars, so you have to make that decision. When do I want to build it so that I have those stars attracting more people in each round and gaining more money each round, and also getting that fourth park action every round? At the same time, if you build it right away, it costs 20 coins, and you won't have a lot, lot of money, and you'll be scrounging for money the rest of the game. So trying to decide when is the best uh, time to build that showcase is part of the strategy of the game. Then we move to cleanup. In the cleanup, you're going to clear up this market, put them in the discard, you're going to refill it, going to put this back to the beginning. You're going to discard down to five. So if anyone has gained more than five cards, they're going to discard. And that's how we do the cleanup. All right, after you've played through the six rounds, you get points based on, and this is explained on the back, how good your attractions are in terms of how many icons they have. So let me set up what it might look like at the end of the game and show you how we would score. So this is what my park might look like at the end of the game, and perhaps I've gained these two blueprints along the way. And then I'm going to look at the back of this player aids card, and it tells me how to score. So first we look at the attraction size, and we score more points depending on the number of icons in the attraction. And the icons are these little um, notations here, these little icons down the side, the left side of each card. So in my um, showcase attraction, I, it has a robot theme, the roller coaster icon, quality icon, jungle theme, a corkscrew element, and an inclined loop. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six icons, meaning I'm going to score 25 points for this. And then this one, my gingerbread house with a pirate theme, only has two, which is worth eight points. And then my cinema with comfortable seating and air conditioning only has, that's three icons, worth 12 points. And then my water slide attraction with a robot theme and lockers and coat check is worth four icons. And so that is worth 16 points, or has four icons. 
and then I'm just going to tally that up for my score for the attraction. Then I'm going to look at blueprints. Now on my blueprints, this one says I'll get 10 points if I have any thrill ride with any feature and any feature. Well, I've got my thrill ride here, my Super Attraction Tech Defender Ultra, and I've got an upgrade incline loop feature and an upgrade feature corkscrew element. So I satisfy that, so I'm going to get those 10 points. And then below it says bonus target, any food outlet. Well, I was able to get the gingerbread house, which is a food outlet, and so that's going to give me another 5, and that is one of the easy blueprints. Now here's a medium blueprint. It says any thrill ride with any feature upgrade. Yeah, great. This thrill ride does have a feature just like we saw in the previous blueprint. Nice overlap helps me out. And then in my food outlet, it says with any guest services. Well, I've got a food outlet, but I wasn't able to put any guest service upgrades there. So I fail this one, which means even if I get this one or not, I can't earn those bonus points. And so I would lose 10 for not getting that second blueprint fulfilled. And so that's how we score the blueprints. And then for the coins, it's two points for every one, or two coins for every one point. So if I have 15, that is going to be seven. So 15 divided by two rounded down. And then for my staff members, we're going to see if any of those give me game end uh, scoring. So this says at game end, this staff member scores three points for each pirate theme icon in your park. And we do have a pirate theme icon here. So that's going to give me another three points for that staff member. And then we're going to look at the award and see who has the most quality icons. And I do have one of those quality icons in my park, but probably someone else would have more than one. Whoever gets the most is going to get those 15 points. We tally up the points, and the one with the most points wins. So now that you know the basics of playing Funfair, let me talk about the three things that I enjoy about the game, three things that either I didn't care for or I could see other people not liking, and then also three other recommendations for games you might enjoy if you like Funfair. So the first thing that I really enjoy about Funfair is the theme. I love the theme park theme. I loved going to theme parks growing up. I have great memories of going to the theme parks with my friends and my family. I also remember going to theme parks and thinking about the great thrill rides I would create if I were designing a, a, a roller coaster and just being able to think through that, the hilarity of making a pirate themed gingerbread house food outlet. And then you can even have like a pirate robot theme so you can combine themes together. Uh, really interesting and just brings back good memories. It's just a fun theme to have in the game in my opinion. So that's the first thing I enjoy about the game. The second thing that I enjoy is that it is actually pretty easy to play once you get over the initial understanding of the rules and how everything fits together. And it's also a pretty quick game. It's just six rounds as long as everybody understands the game. And so it's one of those maybe longer filler games or one that's maybe the main game of the night, but you could play it a couple of times. Maybe if the some of the players are new, you could play it once as a teaching game or even halfway through as a teaching game and then start it over and play the whole game where everybody kind of has a good solid feeling of the rules. So I like that length of game. It gives flexibility. And I like games that are reasonably easy to teach players who've played other modern board games. The third thing that I enjoy is the board game layout and the iconography makes quite a bit of sense to me. There are some games that that's not true for me personally, but this one does. I like how this roller coaster moves to the city event and reminds us, oh yeah, we've got to do that. And then the park turns and then the guest turns and the cleanup turns. So that kind of tracks along as you go. And then the card icons, they make sense. All the features have these flags on them. All the themes have a little letter. Quality says the word quality. Thrill Ride has a roller coaster icon and on and on. So the icons are really clear. And yet in spite of how clear the board is and how clear the iconography is, they still give you this player aid, which is nice to remind you of what you do in every step. And it's very clear. And then also the scoring. So in this nice little small player aid, it's all summarized here. And even though the game's fairly simple and everything's laid out nicely, I like the fact that they still included that player aid. And so that's the third thing that I really enjoy about Funfair. There are some things that I didn't care for as much, or I think other players might not enjoy. So let's get into those next. The first thing is, to get started with the game, you really do have to kind of have an understanding of all the rules before you can start. Because some of the decisions you make right at the very beginning, for instance, the blueprint you might take in the first turn or two, you really need to understand what are all the options. You need to understand what are all the different kinds of attractions that are out there and what are all the different kinds of upgrades and features and things that are out there so that the blueprint cards even make sense. You have to understand what all these actions, the different types of park actions that you can take, um, what the finest park award even means. Like if it just says most quality icons and you don't even know what the quality icons are, you need to understand that. You need to understand how to measure the icons and how to read this chart on the back to see 
how those numbers of icons are going to score your attraction. There's just a lot of overhead at the beginning. And if you don't understand at the beginning, if you kind of learn it as you go, you're going to feel like, oh man, I would have made different decisions in that first round. Or I would have made different decisions in that second round if I'd have known that. So I feel like to do well, you have to know it all at the beginning. And so that I think gives a little bit of a barrier to entry. And I think it also makes it a game where I wouldn't consider this a true gateway. I think it, it looks like it should be. And when you're playing it, it feels pretty easy. But if I'm introducing this to people who have never played modern board games, I think that's a lot of overhead to try to get over at the beginning. Now, maybe if we just kind of play a couple rounds and walk them through it, but I think that may be a tall task for people who just have never played board games like this before. Now, if they've played other modern board games, even not complex ones, they're just kind of getting into the hobby. This one isn't a difficult one, but I would say it's maybe a gateway plus level in my opinion. And so that big overhead right at the beginning to me is a little bit of a catch, at least something to be aware of. The second is, in my opinion, there's a lot of luck in this game. And if you're a kind of a player who doesn't want that luck factor, wants total control, that could really set you the wrong way. Um, in fact, every game we've played so far, whether it's been two player, three player, four player, every time we've played it, there's always been at least one player who has spent several rounds looking for a particular type of card, not just a specific card, but just a specific type of card and could not find it. And so they had no opportunity fo to fulfill the blueprint. Um, and so that I think was just kind of frustrating. Also, some people picked up blueprint cards just randomly that fit perfectly together and others picked up blueprint cards randomly that just seemed to kind of be disparate and really hard to coordinate. Also, the city cards, sometimes when they come out and which ones come out, they might really benefit one player that needed that action and another player might think, ah, oh, that didn't really help me at all. There's just a lot of things that are pretty random and seem real luck based. And so if that's not the kind of game you enjoy, this might not be the game for you. And then the last one, and I've, I've only played it six or seven times, so I'm, I don't know that I'm an expert in the game by any means, but it does feel like there's maybe too few attraction cards. There's lots of upgrades and features and theme cards and staff members, and it feels like they kind of clog the deck. The cards that players, as I mentioned, sometimes every game there's been at least one player just struggling to find a certain card. It's always been an attraction card, and I wonder if there just needs to be more attractions. Now, I could see that this game would be you know, a perfect example of one that could use an expansion. There's only four, five or six award cards here. They could come up with all different kinds of awards. Um, they could make more blueprints, more city cards, and I think they could come up with different and more attractions to flesh out this deck. And so if there were more attractions, I would feel like maybe some of that frustration and, and the luck aspect of it might be diminished a bit, at least in the park cards, not so much in the others, but at least in the park cards. But for now, to me, it feels like there should be more attraction cards than all the upgrades. So that one kind of is a holdback for me. So those are the three things I really liked and didn't like. Final thoughts. Um, I enjoy the game. I wouldn't say it's one that I'm always going to want to look for to play. But if someone really likes theme parks and they're interested in playing a game, a modern board game, I'd pull it off the shelf and play it. Or if someone said, hey, do you want to play Funfair? Sure, I'd be glad to play it. So I enjoy it. But it's not one I'm going to keep coming back to all over and over on my own um, just because of that luck factor primarily for me. I love the way it looks. It is a nice game, a cute game. Um, and I'd always be happy to play it, but it isn't necessarily one of the first ones I'd pull off my shelf. Now, what are some other games you might like if this seems interesting to you, but maybe you want a slightly different shift or you've played Funfair and you really love it and you're thinking of what are some other games that might be like that that I would enjoy as well. well I'm going to cheat on the first couple so it's not going to count as my three. It's sort of a bonus because these two I haven't played. But one is Unfair, which is actually, I think, the original game this was based on, and it had a lot more take that. In this case, people might take the card you really wanted, but they probably don't even know that you wanted it. And so there's not really any take that in this one. It's a very kind, everyone's sort of building their own park and kind of minding their own business for the most part. Whereas I've heard in Unfair, it's very take that, very unfair. Um, and so if you, that's, if you want more of that, try Unfair um, based on what I've heard. And then another one that I've heard good things about is Meeple Land, another one where you're kind of building a theme park. Again, those two I haven't played, but those are bonus suggestions for you to maybe look into and see what you think about those. Now, three games that I have played that I could recommend. If you want what you feel in Funfair, but with maybe slightly less luck and a little more agency, but also maybe just slightly more complexity, not a lot more, I would suggest Wingspan by Stonemaier Games. Uh, Wingspan has that card drafting, tableau building kind of feel, and it's 
it feels to me very similar in gameplay, and um, even though I think there's a little bit more agency. You also have a few more things going on, like some dice rolling and a very unique mechanism of moving your um, token down the board as you are taking your actions. So there's a few extra things going there. I'd say it's slightly more complex, um, but another beautiful game and one that I think has some similar mechanisms and similar feels to uh, Funfair. The second one I would recommend if you want to ratchet it up another notch is go to Terraforming Mars. I think that one is a much more higher level of complexity. It's also a much longer game, um, but I think in my opinion, it's more satisfying than this one because there is much more agency, in my opinion, a lot less luck because of the way that game plays. And there's a lot more going on with that one. Um, but Terraforming Mars also has that tableau building and card drafting, uh, but just with more things built on. So Terraforming Mars might be one that if you really want to take it up a notch or two, you could consider that one. And then the last one I would recommend is Seven Wonders or Seven Wonders Duel. Seven Wonders, if you want a game, you can play with a lot of players because this one lim is limited to four. Uh, but still has a card drafting mechanism. Here you're drafting them from a market. Um, there you're actually passing them as you draft, but you're still building up a tableau and trying to combo cards. It has some def definite similar feels, and I would say it's on similar level of complexity as this game, in my opinion. And then if you just want a two-player version, you can go for Seven Wonders Duel, which also has a lot of those same kind of feels. Um, same thing, I think about the same level of complexity as this game. So those are some games that I would recommend if you like Funfair or if the sound of Funfair is appealing to you and you're just curious what other games might be similar. So hopefully this was helpful to you to learn about the game and hear my thoughts. Again, these are my opinions, but if it was helpful for you, I'd love it if you'd click on that thumbs up down below and give the video a like. It'd be terrific if you'd subscribe to the channel and leave some comments. Maybe you have different thoughts about Funfair. Maybe you have uh, questions about the game you want to ask in those comments below. I'd love to interact with you through those comments. As always, thanks for watching. This is Billy Indiana, signing off. Huh.